bargain beyond the uh, uh, sort of like uh, the fancy story, the uh, romantic uh, sort of like uh, success story, but really talk about numbers, talk about the research behind it, and create uh, a platform, something that, that we can uh, basically relate uh, going forward and how the entrepreneurship movement in Indonesia uh, is at the moment and where it should be heading. Um, so I guess allow me to bore you for the next 30-40 uh, minutes to talk about lots of numbers and, and basically concept and thesis behind what is uh, entrepreneurship and basically how it should go and how it should coincide with the uh, education system uh, in Indonesia. So, where we are, WEF, World Economic Forum, was here about a month ago, I think, and this is, there's no longer um, poor country or less developed, developing and developed uh, world anymore. How they divide uh, the world is now on three uh, pillars. Basically, one is factor-driven economy. The second uh, pillar is the efficiency-driven economy. And the uh, third one is the innovations-driven economy. And if you look at the characteristic of the factor-driven economy is the, uh, are the countries uh, which basically have GDP per capita of under $2,000 per capita. So these are some of the African countries, the South Asian uh, countries. And between the $2,000 uh, $2, to $3,000 uh, GDP per capita, then you have the transitions from stage one to stage two. So stage one to stage two is between 2,000 and 3,000. Indonesia just graduated from the factor driven and transitions from stage one. Effectively last year, we broke $3,000 uh, GDP per capita, making us now going into the efficiency driven economy. So uh, this is where we are now on the uh, efficiency driven economy. And I think given the trajectory of the economic growth going forward, Indonesia will reach the um, innovations driven economy, which characterized by the GDP per capita of 17,000 by the year of 2025, some say year of 2030. This is the overview of how I see things. I think we ought to look back and see lesson learned from how the interactions between education and entrepreneurship movement in the USA. What is the global entrepreneurship movement uh, today? I think there is some uh, from Technopreneur here and uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week is, is actually coming again here uh, with, together with Pachi Putra uh, in November. And where we are now, and and this is some sponsor from my dad who originated uh, Min Er Uno Foundations. Uh, what do we do actually within the, the context of, of entrepreneurship? Um, so lessons from the USA, uh, back to the future. We see what is so important in the USA from the education standpoint. It's basically the institutions of higher learning, university. If you look at even in the Midwest, in a very uh, cold place, like um, I, I went to school in Wichita, uh, in, in Kansas, and I think when I, I came there, only 300,000 people, but when we move about 25 kilometers south, there's a uh, small town well, actually not south, but north. It's a small town called Manhattan, maybe less than 5,000 people, but there's a great university there. What I'm trying to say is the university are really the primary source that attract and create talent, create values, and play a vital role in the, um, uh, the economy of the USA. You see university across the countries, 3,600 really uh, a major university, and 500 of them are research university. So if you look at Indonesia now, compared to the US, we're still in the very beginning of this uh, education uh, uh, transformations, but you see in the US, one out of 12 research universities has actually te technology licensing office. This is world-class 
uh, university and they create patterns, they create uh, uh, basically center of excellence. And this, I, I believe, is the reasons why USA has 7% of its populations are entrepreneurs. Indonesia now, some say, and uh, I think the figure that uh, is always used is 0 0.18, I think less than 400,000 uh, entrepreneurs in Indonesia. Um, and, and this is uh, actually a huge challenge for us to be able to develop our economy going forward. So from university, you move to knowledge economy, and then you have economic growth. So basically, education is the bedrock. It's the foundations where you, uh, you move the society into innovation uh, economy, innovation-driven economy. Um, lessons from Stanford, I, I believe everybody knows uh, Stanford University. They are not trying to make themselves as incubators. They are stick or they are loyal to their core to becoming an educational experience. School missions does not change. They, they don't suddenly become a, a, a launch pad for, for startups. But because of their proximities to Silicon Valley, because their proximities to resources and talents, and companies like Google, Apple, uh, companies like YouTube, they suddenly achieve something from this educational platform. They are able to create 10% of their um, graduates to launch a company within uh, years of graduation. This is remarkable. If you compare to Harvard, Harvard is less than 5%, and some other universities below 3%. So why is Sanford is so successful? Is it because they're loyal to their core of providing educational platform for entrepreneurship, and then making uh, networking and making a, a close interactions with uh, the Googles of the world, the Yahoo, and, and so on and so forth. So this is what, what I think we should, we should learn from, from the model that, that actually worked uh, in, in San Francisco, in, in Palo Alto. So from the innovations-driven economy, we learn one thing, that um, this is innovations, because the US is way past $17,000 GDP per capita. Basically, what Scott always, that, that is his mantra, Scott Younger, uh, OBE. Um, you need to have good infrastructures. But today, we're not talking about good infrastructures because I've tried to build, for the last four years, one single road, and not a single centimeter is being built because there is no availability of the land. So we're not talking about infrastructure, Scott, today. Edu we're talking about education and other basic efficiency factors that would enable an entrepreneurial community to be born. So where is where are we missing here? Sama datang Pak. Mau ngomong sekarang atau nanti setelah? Because I was told to provide you a stage. Uh, I think what is the most important thing is shaping attitudes. This is what we are missing in the entrepreneurial and, and actually the society in general in Indonesia. What is our attitude? Read the paper. Out of the nine headlines, 12 are negative. The attitude of the people are so negative and pessimistic if you read the media, the papers. And, and I think the good news, the positive, and the optimism are really fighting to, to get it up there. So if, if, if you uh, look at uh, you know, uh, the headlines, you speak about Nazaruddin case, corruptions, and uh, much of the, um, you know, Stuff that would, that would basically create a, an attitude of, of negativity and, and pessimism. And if you look at the innovation driven economy, the attitude is very, very critical because entrepreneurial is created by way of choice, it's not by way of necessity. Much of the Indonesian entrepreneurs, we're talking about 50 million UMKM, Usaha Mikro Kecil Menengah, Micro Entrepreneurs. They are not there because they want to be entrepreneur. They are there because there is no job provided for them. So as a, um, you know, uh, options of last uh, recourse, then they go to a sort for entrepreneurial uh, activities. So these are not entrepreneurs. So when people ask, how come our entrepreneurs only 400,000, while our 
micro entrepreneurs we have 50 million because the micro entrepreneurs are not classified or categorized and defined as entrepreneurs because they lack resources their lack of financing their lack lack of innovations they are there just by accident and trying to, to actually bring food to the, uh, to the table. So what we need to clear, uh, create here is entrepreneurs by choice, entrepreneurs by opportunity. Um, this is where uh, you would know this global entrepreneurship movement. Uh, it's, it's actually getting vital across the world. 110 million, this is by, by Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, the 2010 uh, global report. Unfortunately, Indonesia is not featured because uh, nobody uh, in you know in Indonesia, 240 million, would want to pay uh, five thousand dollars to be in the in the research. So next year we'll probably uh, bring in because it has to be a school. Uh, it has to be a university that participated. So maybe uh, the President University or Paramadina may may be able to uh, to be included in the in the global report. So 110 million people, actually between age of 18 to 64 years old, uh, uh, have engaged in, entrepreneur, uh, in actually starting a business uh, in, in that particular year. 140 million were running new business. That is actually three and a half years uh, or earlier, which is, which is remarkable because these are new businesses that are being started. Uh, 63 million uh, will employ at least five people. That's 300 million plus uh, employment, and actually 27 million out of that number will employ more than 20 people. That's more than 400 million uh, people to be employed. So in this juncture, would we want to become a spectator or would we want to become a player? So we need to choose, and I think the answer is obvious that we want to be a player in this game, in this growing. Indonesia is the 16th largest economy, but when you land, when you land yourself in Jakarta, you don't feel like you're landing into the 16th largest economy in the world. The airport looks more like a bus terminal, <laughs> and and we need to to change this attitude. We need to change this feeling, and we need to uh, be a player in this growing transformation so that. Uh, Indonesia can be uh, basically a world-class uh, player. Uh, where we are, this is the uh, uh, the, the the charts that uh, the charts that is uh, you know sometimes get really uh, misperceived uh, and uh, there's a strong misconception uh, about this. We uh, on the uh, basically the, um, the left side. You see uh, the, our competitor, Brazil, uh, Russia, India. And unfortunately, India is also not participating, but there is a new member in BRIC, which is South Africa here. If you look at this chart, the higher, um, uh, basically, the GDP per capita of a country, the lesser the number of entrepreneurs. This is remarkable. So instead of us being proud of having 50 million micro entrepreneurs, we should actually lower that number down. So we should, you know, the jargon, and, and I was involved in this creating uh, jargon for HIPMI when I was uh, uh, chairman of HIPMI. Kita mesti menciptakan 4 juta entrepreneur baru. I think that's, that's actually a misconception because what, what we need to do is actually to convert uh, the large number of uh, entrepreneurs moving from micro to small, small to medium. So that if you look at the evolution of China and Brazil and South Africa and Russia, they're actually moving towards, as the GDP per capita grow, the number of entrepreneurs will, will come down. And this is what's going to happen in Indonesia. Some of, of these uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, whereas Indonesia, Indonesia is actually up there. Our um, percentage of populations that is in the uh, micro entrepreneurs uh, activity is very high, 50 million, the number. But the uh, impact to uh, the GDP per capita is still very low. So we would be moving, uh, going down. On the left is entrepreneurs by necessity, entrepreneurs kapaksa, entrepreneurs yang kepepet. Uh, you know, basically they have n no other options but to start 
becoming a street vendors. Uh, if they don't do that, they would not be able to make a living. Uh, on the right hand side is this entrepreneurs by choice, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs by opportunity, entrepreneurs by uh, created by the enabling uh, society or the landscape. So uh, I guess we have some, some homework to do. Um, this is uh, the quote and, and the conclusions of the, uh, uh, the 2010 Global Entrepreneurship Monitor is that entrepreneurship doesn't impact economically simply by the large numbers. And this is what I've, I've been trying to say. But it's actually uh, the, the growth, the quality, and, and the infrastructure that is more important. And, and, and hence, I think the mantra, the jargon for the next uh, few years ahead is for us to convert the 50 million micro entrepreneurs to become the SME entrepreneurs. Uh, this is the uh, ranking, the last year ranking. Actually, we got worse. Uh, in terms of ease of doing business, we're now number 121. Uh, out of 183 countries, that's really embarrassing <laughs> because uh, it can take up to 60 days to start a company in Indonesia um, and 60 days uh, for uh, micro entrepreneurs or for uh, a startup is like eternity. You, you, it's, it's basically a make or break. You need to be able to move up, to be able to start your business within weeks or within two weeks uh, in order for us to move into the G20. You all. Um, and we're actually number 155 in, in starting a business. It's like playing soccer. We're, the size of our economy is 16th largest uh, in the world. We're in the Premier League. But uh, in terms of starting a business, we're the bottom of the pile. We're actually in Tarkam, you know, Antar Kampong. <laughs> uh, um, this is actually uh, a proof to the point that as the GDP per capita grow, the ease of doing business is actually improved. So we're, we're, we're actually uh, up there in number 100, whatever. We actually are not in the charts because <laughs> this is really, uh, this only catered to number 40. Uh, but if you look at when the GDP per capita improved to uh, uh, way past 50,000, uh, then you see the ease of doing business is actually improved. What are the key success factors in efficiency-driven economy? So we are now firmly in efficiency-driven economy. We're now, last year is 3,010 uh, dollar GDP per capita, and I, I believe we're on a trajectory to reach 6,000 uh, dollars per capita within five years. Is the efficiency enhancers would be the higher education and training, and this is. I think where our focus should be, uh, education, uh, uh, along the other factors like market size, technological readiness, financial market, but I want to focus on uh, higher education and, and training as a key for efficiency-driven economies. Uh, so where is Indonesia in terms of education? We're number 108 out of 169. Again. Uh, this is not something to be to be proud of because uh, we're, we're actually um, bottom of the bottom of the pool uh, below 50 percent. So we need to improve on the uh, education human uh, development index, and this is a, a chart that that will show that as education improve, you see the GDP per capita also improve. So some of the countries that that actually enjoys higher GDP per capita would have. A, a much higher percentage of, of education's enrollment. So uh, I guess this is the last part of, of my presentations and why I think um, I think the thesis today and the platform and the mass up uh, that I want to uh, basically come across today is uh, some of the entrepreneurial movements and if you see uh, people in in TV, uh, in radio, giving coaching, giving mentoring about entrepreneurship, is the get rich quick scheme. Cara cepat menjadi miliarder. You know, quick way to become a billionaire. Uh, quick way to achieve success. And basically, this instantaneous, uh, you know, to be instant like 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 this uh, entrepreneur's idol, 
uh, Dragon Dan and everything that is basically uh, you know good to create awareness, but it's starting to shape uh, an attitude within entrepreneurs that they want to get rich very quickly. And this is, I guess, um, you know, our task, our jobs uh, within the entrepreneurial community to bring uh, uh, basically the realities to, to the ground and, and see that success will not be reached by, um, you know, instant, uh, very instant. You need to work hard and it has to take a process. So uh, this is what uh, Min Uno Foundation is doing. It started in 2000. While I was struggling as an entrepreneur, uh, you see my mom in the middle, very happy. Uh, and some of the staff, uh, sorry that you're not here. I don't know where were you. Probably you were taking the picture, this one. So started in 2000, uh, focused on uh, youth empowerment through entrepreneurship, because I believe I made it here through entrepreneurship, and I want others to experience the, the same thing. I basically started from zero when I was uh, uh, left out of a job in 1998, started my business with uh, three people, and through hard work, 13 uh, years now and counting, uh, our business uh, has, alhamdulillah, grow from three people now, we, we employ about 20,000 people uh, across Indonesia. So, our focus is to target uh, college students and micro-enterprises, and this is the, um, sort of like the, uh, Field that we need to attack: universities and micro entrepreneurs, and these are the embryos for future entrepreneurs going forward. Um, and and we we have uh, uh, some of our activities, uh, training lectures, uh, and workshop. Uh, I think we believe uh, there is a new president of TDA. Where, where are you? Komunitas uh, Tangan Di Atas from the back. Thank you for coming. Uh, the community Tangan Di Atas is basically a community of about 20,000 online um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, activists. It took them only less than two years to build like 20,000. Hidney took 40 years to have about 40,000 members. So you see how social media through Twitter, through Facebook can create such a massive uh, viral attack on, on a community and, and create an entrepreneurial uh, community. Uh, we have uh, uh, also uh, some cooperations with Young Entrepreneurs Academy, uh, with Shell and Blackwire, Mandiri, we also have uh, Mandiri, and, and also with Jisang Su Prime Award. The thesis is basically people should be an entrepreneur by way of choice, not by way of accident, and they should have that as an option. As an option, even though they can uh, also get by by Employ, uh, by taking employment or by uh, applying for a job. So this is the choice. They should not be forced into entrepreneurship, but they should be uh, basically making it uh, as a choice, as an option. Um, the networking, the dialogues that needs to continue between government and the private sectors, this is where we uh, focus the university and the NGOs, civil society, in order to create new startups, uh, we, uh, we, we put a network so that they can have a bit business environment uh, funding and they have access to product and services and they can reach a uh, market. So what does the government needs to do? The government needs to basically give policies and reg regulations. And this is what uh, lacking at the moment. Uh, I'm sure there's no government people here, but uh, <laughs> they don't care about entrepreneurship. Uh, they, instead of the putting good policies and regulations to work, sometimes they actually tax uh, new entrepreneurs. Uh, licenses, permits is uh, always being uh, corrupted, and it takes basically very, very, with, with great difficulties for these young entrepreneurs to start business because the policies and regulations keep on changing. Uh, and government also, other than policies and regulations, also needs to provide opportunity and, and the capital. And, and so are the private sectors and NGOs. So this collaboration, I think this is the bedrock and how uh, entrepreneurs and startup movements can, can be created uh, going forward. Uh, core activities, we will spend 80% of our time in shaping the mindset. I, I mentioned already how, how we think 
uh, a mindset is very important because we need more optimism, we need more positive energy uh, from our uh, country. So that uh, uh, I think the best way that we've been focusing is more on student seminars and, and lecture training. Of course, there is uh, development of skill and know-how as well as business development as uh, a, a complementing activities to uh, to help the, the shaping of the mindset. This is the slide that I want to sp uh, speak a little bit more. Um, where we are, which is like the classroom uh, activities, and where we should be, which is the entrepreneurial experiential learning. And to show our education system does not really concentrate on development of entrepreneurs. Some of us uh, earlier asked, where should we start? Should we start at university or should we start as uh, high school? Because people get confused when they come into uh, high school, they follow their friends into university. When they, they graduate uh, out of university, then they follow the trend. If the sectors that's booming is banking, everybody goes to banking. If the sectors that's booming is mining, everybody goes to mining. It's the me too and hurt mentality that actually hurting the, the entrepreneurship movement. This is where uh, the difference are. In the current classroom, we only learn from teachers. And this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, a setting that is prevalent in all university. Somebody sit up front in the podium, and people sit uh, underneath as a class, uh, in a classroom. I think future classrooms should be around uh, like a town hall discussions, whereby you learn from many persons. A teacher would come in and basically trigger a discussion. And then there's a discussions on ongoing discussions that that's actually uh, follow suit. Um, in the classroom today, we learn from printed text. We should move to sharing and discussions. It's basically um, you know getting engaging uh, as uh, much as possible during the, the class. Uh, in the classroom today, student as listener. I'm sorry you guys are listening to me now. <laughs> I'm giving a major thesis, but in the entrepreneurial experience. You need to do trial and error, feedback. You need to encourage people to try. And encourage people, and believe it or not, to make mistake. To make mistake. In this society in Indonesia, it is very, very costly to make a mistake. Not like in other society. When you make a mistake, when you fail in Indonesia, it is very painful. Try losing a job in Indonesia. You'll be punished because you can go to even to your family gathering because people will look down on you. Um, I have a, some, a, a good friend of mine who is actually a grandson uh, of one of the entrepreneurs in the yester years who failed. Up until now, there's a label to him. Oh, he's the grandson of that entrepreneur who failed. Um, and, and I think uh, I, I learned it the hard way in 1998 when I lost my job that actually Going out, meeting friends uh, in uh, you know cafe and everybody. Everybody would ask, "Where do you work? Where do you work?" And then when I say that uh, I don't work or uh, I'm trying to start a business, people are starting to look down on you. So this is uh, how how our culture uh, treat uh, failure. In the Silicon Valley, uh, an entrepreneur can be bankrupt this week. Next week, he's already out there carrying his next business proposal. And society accept that. In Indonesia, it's try closing your company. Try closing. Try fire people here. It's impossible. And closing company is even more impossible. So, you know, that's that's that would be needed to to create an entrepreneurial society. Try um, The content is predetermined in the current classroom. Uh, and in an entrepreneurial experience, it should be by guided by discovery. Uh, it, it is now by pre-planned conditions going forward. It should be an informal and flexible uh, conditions. Now, this is the important part for people from university. In the classroom now, people have pressure of uh, real goal and actually trying to achieve grades. While in an entrepreneurial, it has to be pressure to achieve real goals, but with incentive the stimulus at the end of the project. That's, that's what, what we should move uh, into. Uh, problem solving for later, which is now, going forward, it should be face real problems on the spot. Problems in the community.
problems that social uh, society are, are facing. That should be really not textbook, but for instance, traffic. Jakarta is, uh, is getting worse on traffic, and I think the average speed now spot is uh, 10 kilometers uh, an hour, uh, which is slower than your treadmill this morning at the financial club. But uh, that, that is uh, the problem that uh, going forward we need to, to solve. This is another important thing. In the classroom today, imitating and copying are prohibited. Tomorrow, it should be encouraged. In the real entrepreneurial case, it's always ATM. Amati, tiru, dan modifikasi. It should be like, like that. But you need to improve. There is a value added that you need to do. Not just imitate and copy as it is, but you need to improve. You need to real uh, adding the value into whatever you're trying to, to achieve. So you need to watch, you need to monitor, and you need to execute, and you need to improve it. And then, uh, this is what, uh, another point that I, I've already alluded uh, before. Mistakes are feared, and it's perceived as negative. Going forward, mistakes are seen as a chance to learn. Failure is a, basically anak tangga or a step to be a successful. So you need to fail. If you're successful, you need to fail many, many times. Uh, not in our current setup. In our current setup, it's one ticket to success, one ticket to stardom. You will not able to, to be uh, uh, basically uh, making mistakes. Uh, getting failures. Uh, here in Indonesia, especially today, people are so concerned about image, about citra. If you're successful, there should not be any negative news about you. And I'm experiencing it now. You know, and, and, and I think that's uh, 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 basically uh, acceptable in any society. When you're successful, you should have problems. Semakin kita uh, memanjat pohon, semakin keras angin menerpa. As you climb higher, the wind will blow very uh, hard on your face. So that's that's basically wh what I'm trying to, to say. Mistakes are uh, need to be uh, to be forgiven, and mistakes needs to be used as a stepping stone for for success. Um, I tell you the story of uh, my. Uh, my daughter, when, when she was uh, much younger, she's now 14, but when she was seven, eight years old, she started some entrepreneurial activities uh, in, in the classroom uh, 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 at school. So she likes to create these uh, bracelets and necklace from beads. So she asked from, uh, uh, from me some, some capital. Uh, she asked money from me. Uh, she said she wanted to buy beads to to basically make bracelets and necklaces to sell to uh, to her friends. So uh, she did this for about two months and uh, her savings is actually, I can see because she put uh, whatever uh, revenue she gets from that activities into a, a transparent jar. Uh, but after two months, uh, the, uh, the jar is not uh, increasing the, the content and she's not uh, that cheerful anymore. So I asked what happened. She said that, um, you know, basically, a teacher told me not to, uh, not to do it anymore. I said, why? Uh, and she, I said, did you do it uh, during class? No, I was uh, doing it after school is done. So why is the teacher stopping you? And the teacher said, jangan dong, jangan berjualan di, kamu jangan berjualan karena malu-maluin. Actually, it's embarrassing, uh, don't, uh, sell bracelet because it's embarrassing. It's, uh, and, and I said, why uh, is it embarrassing? And she said that, well, your father is actually a successful entrepreneur. So why are you <laughs> selling bracelets as if you don't have money? I said that. This is really the problem within uh, our school system. In, instead of promoting entrepreneurial activities among the young kids, they're actually stopping it. Why? Because it is malu malu, it is embarrassing. I think what is malu malu in is not selling bracelet. What is malu malu in is, is a lot of other things that people do uh, in politics. But 
<laughs> doing entrepreneurial uh, activities is not embarrassing and it should be um, embedded in, in our culture. I'd like to close this with, with my last slide. So what I'm trying to get across after this uh, 45 minutes is that entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurship is not a profession, it's a mindset. It is basically a collective, uh, it's a mindset that comes as a result of a collective, uh, uh, basically, behavior such as hard work, uh, thinking outside the box, never say give up, and uh, never, uh, you know, uh, never ever uh, surrender. Um, and, and basically, it is always optimism, always seeing the glass uh, half full rather than half empty. And, and basically, you need to be innovative and creative. And that sense of behavior would, would form a change in the mindset that would be the fundamental uh, uh, works for entrepreneurship in Indonesia going forward. Um, you know, I think uh, this, this is a way uh, departure from the, you know, my, my mentor, my senior, Bob Salino who will always say, just do it. Don't even think, just do it. I would say, if you need, and if you want to create a strong, sustainable entrepreneurship movement here, you have to do a plan, you have to do checking, coordinate, then action. Don't just do it, I mean, throwing people to, to the pool. Some people will be able to swim, but some people will die because uh, they're not able to swim. So. I think we need to create this uh, uh, sort of like the uh, culture, the education system that would enable the entrepreneurial movement for Indonesia to achieve greatness. And by the year 2050, some say with the trajectory, Indonesia will be the fifth largest economy in the world that is higher than Japan, uh, Netherlands, Portuguese, three countries that have occupied us in the past. With that, I close. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi And it is a very inspiring speech you give us, and we never knew what uh, you said before. We thought that entrepreneurs could be anybody that they can, as a dream, and wants to do it themselves, and they feel in, in, in the process. And then they, then they uh, the result system is not there. But uh, anyway, we have uh, still have about one hour uh, for uh, question and answer. Of course, yours, no, but anyone uh, wants to ask the first question? Yes. <laughs>